Welcome. Good evening. Very nice to be here. Thank you for your company. Oh, I'm fine. I'm kind of little on the stage before I tell you all who we are. Uh, welcome. And uh, we're your warm-up acts, in case you're still <laughs> playing this evening. Yes. Uh, let me tell you who we all are. I'll start with my guests. Ian Dunt, editor of politics.co.uk, also author of Brexit, What the Hell Happens Now? He will tell you, even if the government can't. Uh, Gina Miller, of course, very famous for her campaign with regards to Brexit, forcing us to have, we hope, a parliamentary vote on what the deal is. And of course, a businesswoman, and most recently actually voted the most influential black person in the UK. Is that right, Gina? Okay. <laughs> Tracy Ann Oven, actress, writer, and columnist. Lovely to have you with us. At least we've got a professional actor on the stage. <laughs> We're all Everything just by. <laughs> and uh, my name's Emma Barnett. I have a programme on the BBC, on Five Live. I present a programme there in the mornings, the news and current affairs show, and I also regularly present Women's Hour, amongst many other things. But it was actually Five Live. I was just going to bring up right at the beginning of this, because what we're going to try and do, our talk is entitled Home is Where the Heart Is. We're going to talk a bit about national identity this evening and uh, I'd love to hear your views as well or any questions you have so we'll open it up to you. Um, but what was very interesting about working on a network like Radio 5 Live and I do a lot of work as I say for Radio 4 is um, they weren't surprised the listeners by Brexit. There's six million or so of them. Uh, it wasn't funereal in tone when those people were getting in touch and listeners across the UK found out the results and um, interestingly they weren't that as aggrieved as perhaps the media were by Donald Trump being elected. So we've had some political earthquakes to name two uh, in the last 12 months and I think what's really interesting is because I have access to a genuine geographical spread through the radio programme that I present, uh, you get a different take on how Britain feels about different things. So I think national identity, I wonder if we can even have one anymore and what that means. So we'll, we'll get into that. But I just wanted to say, on the morning we planned a three-hour Hillary Clinton programme with a lot of Liberals and Democrats sat in London. They all start crying as I announce Donald Trump is officially the president. And the listeners are calling in going, yeah, it'll be all right. Too fine. I was like, okay, there is a dissonance there. So I think that's really interesting to explore. Ian, I'll start with you because I introduced you first. Do you, do you think we still have a national identity? And I'm aware some people haven't seen this play, which is a lot of that. I won't do any spoilers, I promise. Um, yeah, look, I mean, I'm not going to lie. Like my sense of what it is has been shaken over the last 15, 16 months. So the things that I thought of about my country, and I would say things like stability, practical judgment, a sense of fairness. I know it's hard to substantiate this. It's not as if, you know, when you go to Kenya, they don't have a sense of what fairness is. You know, of course that's there. But then nevertheless, the sense that we had of our own country, and certainly that I had, as somewhere that was sort of open and instinctively averse to easy solutions and to sort of authoritarian ideas, I kind of feel like my faith that the country feels that way has been shattered a bit. I know that that's still there, but I suspect you're right. That when we talk about a sense of national identity, really what we're talking about is the prevailing values of the people who occupy, you know, the political structure and the media structure. And that we were probably quite simplistic at that. And it's given us a bit of a jolt to see that things are a little bit more complicated than we'd anticipated. Gina, how does that sit with you? I would, I would agree with everything Ian said, but I don't think it happened this decaying of national identity overnight or actually with Brexit. I think it's been going on for decades because we've had a country where we've sort of changed the nature of our country. We've gone to people who were inventors, we manufactured things, we had an identity collective made in Britain identity to a very middle class professional identity where we productivity went, um, living standards flatlined, and we started seeing a real divide in the country that was driven by our economics, but also this sort of London, southeast gap and the rest of the country, because I was going around the country a lot for, for a lot of things in the last decade or so with my charitable work and also my business, is this idea that there are pockets of the country where people feel that they have no voice, they're disenfranchised and nobody hears them. And we could say that consecutive governments haven't actually lived up to including those people and brought, bring, bringing them into our identity. But what I find really difficult is that um, the flip side of identity is also patriotism. Mm. And now, there are people who 
believe that they own that concept of patriotism. And if someone speaks up against their point of view, they are a traitor. And that idea of patriotism being, or a patriot being owned by extremists, and at the same time, certain elements of the media deciding that they will dis dismantle our institutions, our rule of law, independent voices, experts, academics. Those things in combination are very dangerous because what we end up with is division rather than a very centralist view of ourselves. But we'll come back to some of those thoughts in just a moment. Yes. Do you think there is a sense of national identity you could say, you know, this, this is Britain? No. Back to you. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, obviously, I'm not coming from a political perspective, or, but I can only go through my own observation and how I feel. And I mean, you talk about the, the, the response on radio. I was also quite shocked listening to a lot of Radio 4 sort of phone-ins and talks at the response to what we, I assume, would feel has been, have been big political shocks. I wonder what the demographic is. And I think that they, bringing it back to what the play you're going to see tonight, that sense of what are we and who are we, when I think of... Britain, I think of um, you know all the cliches: um, brave, uh, stoic, uh, a nation of shopkeepers. You know, ultimately middle class. Sort of um, not cautious, but you know, very stable. We have a very stable political climate. This sort of pro this sort of Protestant world surrounded by heated Catholics. You know, it, it's you know it's a very stable country, and we are now committing slow political suicide in front and people don't know who we are anymore or what we're doing and I think we've got exactly the same problem because I don't think we do know and I think when I think of being a student and being a young a young student in the Thatcher time that 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 was a, a sense that brought us back to national identity you know this is what we are Britain can be great but in a Thatcherite way and that, but then there were no but which was very white and sort of middle class and and then I think under Blair, who acknowledged that there were lots of races in this country and lots of people that didn't have that, he tried to incorporate it. And now there's this fracture between the sort of Blairite view of, of um, sort of different identities making it up and that was okay. And, and us putting ourselves apart to some old idea of what we were either during the, during, you know, under the imperial <coughs> colonial days and under Thatcher. So does that make it an impossible place to govern, in that sense? I mean, if we are having these pockets of Britain that feel like they've had no voice for a long time, that they finally do get a voice, which then sends an earthquake or a tremor to Westminster, where I sit every Wednesday and talk to MPs and see how they're doing. At the moment, we're talking about cities. Obviously, we've not remembered any of the other political issues for about 10 days, and I guess not. But, you know, has that, has that made it a country that is almost impossible? Government. Do you really have the no, I don't think so. I mean, the, the reason it's impossible to govern right now is because you have a prime minister with no authority, with no majority, you have no consensus around the cabinet table or in parliament or in the country itself for any of the outcomes that we can follow, whether it's Remain or soft Brexit or hard Brexit. I don't believe that there's consensus for any of those things. But those are quite specific issues that are taking place that are to do with the policy that we're pursuing right now and will be pursuing realistically for the next 10 years or so. Oh, goody. Come yes. There's a lot more chat about country of origin and customs requirements in the next 10 years of your life, I assure you. But, also, um, but, but you know, in terms of really what goes on in the country, no, it just makes us more aware of actually the brilliant sort of ideas and characteristics that the country can have. And that's, I think, quite distinct from any kind of question of government. Well, I was going to say also, the things that we would have looked to in the past to sort of guide us and give us information, you know, this concept now, you can't trust any news outlet, yeah. fake news, it's all, you know, the, 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 lab the labels that are put on, you know, there's these sort of Blairite conspiracy theories, Tory conspiracy theories, right-wing press conspiracy theories. We are turning into a nation of nutters. So, uh, you know, you can't trust, it's almost like we've, you can't even trust what was giving you information in the first place. Can I tell you what, one of the things that's changed is people actually used to get on, people got on with their lives. They trusted the infrastructure, they trusted politicians, and they were busy. They said, we're going to elect you to represent us, and we're going to trust in paying our taxes to know that that's going to go to look after our social good. And there was an element of trust that's slowly been dismantled, either through, because we've let people down, successive governments have let people down, or the media have chipped away at that trust, or there has just been a lack of respect and honesty in our institutions. So all in all, what, hap what has happened is 
that bond of trust is gone. And so they, we need to rebuild that. And I think it is possible to govern this country if we talk a different language. If we start talking about not binary left or right or division, but actually about the country and the values we stand for. Because values are different from a religion or which region you live in or how much you earn. If we have values of tolerance, respect, inclusiveness, those bind us all together. But I thought that might be in some of your answers about what is this country. Which well, is, those are the things that I think are this country. tolerance and taking people in and, you know, people, people working hard. I mean, they've come up in different ways, but they weren't in necessarily any of your original But doesn't, didn't that get blown out the water with the Brexit result? Because the enemy of the people seems to be the people. It's weird, you know, I can't, like... So, I mean, I come, I come from... My mum is Guatemalan and Lebanese. My dad's English. Got brought up on you know the hard streets of Hampshire, and you can imagine like in that kind of setup, yeah, you, know, you can see it. Really, really rough time out. And like you can see that in that kind of context, you actually have this really quite positive view of Britain, of the kind that you've just described. We're very welcome. You get a fair shot. We're taking away, you know, and actually then you suddenly come face to face with this stuff. And coming face to face with it, it it's, I've got to say I, I'm really struggling to access that part of me, that, that patriotic sense in me since the vote. And I'm trying to re-establish connection with it. I get it. I have these sort of moments where I see things that used to do it, like little cobblestone lanes or pubs or stuff that I find deeply reassuring to look at. And I can't quite re-establish that emotional connection. So I've actually started to question how deeply held some of those notions ever were. But and yet, not to ruin the play if you haven't seen it, but there is at the heart of this play a woman who is trying to get back to what England was, you know, this concept of working hard, tending to her garden, you know, worrying about her neighbours. I mean, it doesn't all work out like that, no spoilers. But, but in the sense of, you know, I, I just wonder if that's little England now and it's not where we should be going or how we carve our national identity in life. I was down in Chichester for the last uh, in the summer, which couldn't be more uh, little England. Um, it's beautiful, it's wonderful, the people are great, but it was like, you know, you go back there, I've done a few seasons there, and it's like, you imagine it hasn't changed since 1952. And there's something <coughs> quite comforting about it, and it's lovely with the cream teas and the church bells and the you know, almost totally white um, audience. And, uh, but it's also quite frightening because it feels nothing to do with urban Camden where I grew up or the Manchester Royal Exchange where I was before or on tour when I was down in Bath. It feels like an island all on its own and the values of Chichester in this summer felt like a completely different country. But, but as, a, as a woman of colour being in Britain and being here th over 30 years, this is not the Britain I came to or I thought I was in. Um, and lots of things and there's this <laughs> question that's going round and round in many, so many conversations at the moment, is that how could it have been reversed so quickly? Was it just at the surface? Or was there a sense of irresponsibility going on for quite some time? What's been reversed, and, do you think? Uh, well, this tolerance, you know, the intolerance, this, this whole idea that we were inclusive. We were, you know, the 2012 Olympic slogan was global Britain, open Britain. Mm -hmm. um, it wasn't that long ago. Well, um, we could still be global Britain. Yeah, but I think Britain, we still are there. But, but just not part of the European Union. Yeah, yeah. but that's, this has got nothing to do with the European mm. Union. No, but I, I, <coughs> I was wondering if you were saying it was in reverse since Brexit. So. No, 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 no. I, d I, don't, I think that was something that it was like a volcano that was bubbling up underneath, and that yeah. was a thing that exploded. I don't mm. think it wasn't the reason. It was, a, it was actually one of the symptoms. It's not the reason. Brexit is not the reason for where we are today. It is definitely one of the most severe symptoms of it. But... It's, you know, why is it, if you look at what's happening, the rise of the far right around um, different first world Western cultures, um, we've all been based on liberalism and capitalism, the same models that haven't worked. So we have to be honest about what is it about those two models that have not worked? And are we all responsible in some way for the fact it hasn't worked? Have we all been a bit too lazy? Those who've risen to the top, a bit too irresponsible. Our politicians, a bit too much in search of power. You know, we have to look in the mirror and be honest about why we are where we are and all take responsibility. It can't be that this whole idea of one side is right and the other side is wrong will never get us back to a country that is a whole. But I think, you're, I think you're absolutely right. I think that protest vote that was Brexit and that protest vote that one hopes was Trump 
that voice does need to be heard and honoured uh, because it obviously has caused landless shifts, but somehow the dialogue doesn't seem to be possible. Because you, you said Charlottesville, for example, the march that went, that went on there that mm. feels like it could happen here imminently. It's, we're getting further apart than we are able to talk because I think we don't know what our common language is anymore. I, I don't think that's true. I think if you go into a restaurant, into a bar, if you go into places where ordinary people are, you look in a playground, you sit on a park bench, people are not shouting and screaming at each other. Or, I mean, they might do to me sometimes because <laughs> they're angry at my voice, but on the whole, people are not doing what the media is reporting on the front page. Well, that's why I was interested in what you just said, that this isn't the Britain that you necessarily move to or feel like you've become a part of, because at the end of the day, and also when you say people just getting on with their lives, all the evidence suggests, you know, far from the lovely theatre that we're in, people are just getting on with their lives and are living relatively peacefully. I mean, there are figures, yes, which show hate crimes had a big spur after the Brexit vote, which you may argue is a symptom or not of this. But at the same time, you know, what if, you know, it's just a lot of people doing a lot of hand-wringing, do you know what I mean, at the moment, about the I think, you know, the extremists, the, the, the ones, the 1% or 3% or whatever, who used to be at the end of a pub bar or in a bedroom being extremists, are now doing that on social media and are now, they've amplified their voices and they've got more people listening to them and there's definitely been an increase, but I don't think it's to the extent that the alarmists are saying. Uh -huh. um, but I mean, it definitely increased. Well, there's also a sense, of course, that this was validated right at the top. So after the Brexit vote, there was any number of interpretations you could have put on that thing. And obviously I would have preferred, given the two nations of this country, of this state, didn't vote for Brexit and that there was quite a narrow vote that we'd followed a more moderate interpretation of it. We didn't get that, but not only did we not get that, the crucial point for me, more important than the vote itself, was Theresa May coming out for her conference speech and doing that if you're a citizen of the world, you're a citizen of nowhere. Because that was the point where I just thought, oh Christ, it's, it's a cultural war now. And it's a cultural war validated it from the top, right at number 10. Now that wasn't just a comment, I don't think, against immigrants. And she's a true believer on immigration, Theresa May. She's not mucky about it. She's not like David Cameron, where he's like, I want to do it down to the tens of thousands, and then implement absolutely no policies that would actually make that happen. She's, I think she really believes this stuff. It, it was, I think, also an attack on people who sympathized and associated and felt allies of immigrants. But also, I think it was deeper than that. It was like a modern Tebbit test. You know, if anyone's got a friend from, from the subcontinent, you know, whose heritage is from there, you'll find that they'll support England in the football. And they'll usually support their country, you know, of heritage, in the cricket. That's a sense of having multiple identities. That's a sense of, of, it was really a war on anyone who could hold two ideas in their head at the same time. And that sense was the UKIPization of the Conservative Party. Now that's been knocked off course a bit because of the, the, you know, the humiliation she received at the snap general election. She tried to walk it back a bit in this conference speech. But nevertheless, she the war, the well, yeah, if you could make out what she was saying, she was trying to walk it back a little bit and trying to present a more positive open vision. But nevertheless, there was a sense that that sense of UKIP culture war was absorbed into number 10 and became part of active government policy, and that did us no good whatsoever. But I think also Labour were quite, you know, culpable of this as well, because I think there was no clear leadership, there was no clear hmm. debate, there was no, I think as a Labour Party member, you didn't know which way to vote, and I'm sorry, but I... I think they have their part to play in that as well. And then all, I mean, one final, in, in no, no, my opinion, yeah. you know, you travel around the world, and I travel a lot through work, and the thing that people love and trust and identify with Britain is BBC News. Okay, BBC News is the voice that everybody will listen to, World Service is it. But we're now in an age where nobody believes any news service, or even the BBC, or, you know, the Laura, what happened to Laura Prinsberg. Yeah. It's ridiculous. We don't trust anything. We don't trust even the voice of the nation, you know, the, the, the thing that should be our pride is, is, is also being dismantled and not trusted anymore. Well, I might as well just get off the stage. <laughs> <laughs> but, but politicians have to, a lot of this is at their door. Because you could have taken this vote in a very different way, and they didn't. But it's still, every day, it is absolutely shameful. And the thing I hear from around the rest of the world is, what is going on in Britain? What's happening to you? Mm. You used to be the reasoned people, mm. you know. And this way, the, the one I hear a lot is, um, why are you all collectively self-harming? Exactly. We don't understand mm. it. And uh, respect. We are losing whatever the outcome of this vote. We have already damaged. <coughs> our politicians have damaged our brand. Mm. And it will take 
decades to rebuild it. But haven't we got the politicians we deserve? I knew you They always them. say you ain't yeah. got In all seriousness, yeah. you know, as someone who, who regularly interviews politicians and then gets attacked for being biased one way or the other, but if I get attacked evenly, I'm doing a good job. Um, <laughs> But, but we are in a situation where lots of people have got absolutely no idea what's going on. I'm also someone who worked at a newspaper for seven years and watched the staff get decimated and decimated. So you've got fewer and fewer reporters who can actually go out and report on issues in detail mm -hmm. to do that because people aren't buying newspapers. It's not a claim or a plea for people to buy newspapers, but it's a reality of if we don't have people who invest the time to be up to date with current affairs, in maybe the same way beyond 140 characters. And that's the problem. We're in a bit of a problem <coughs> about the, the value we place on those elected officials. And, 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 and surely the whole point is we, we only want our politics and our news in 140 character sound bites. People aren't interested in nuance or debate or understanding. <coughs> we literally want it in an easy to read Facebook post or a headline. That's what I meant about people being honest. I don't, know, we are. I don't know because um, we have to be, because everyone's, you know, not, it, it can't be that. On one hand, you want the 140 character news, and then the other hand, you want responsibility to vote for everything or say we should be going to a, rep, you know, a direct democracy rather than representative democracy when you won't do the homework <coughs> or try and find out what the so debates what, what are. What do you think potentially, I mean, because we started this conversation and we can come back to this about you know, who we are at the moment and, and how, we, how we are seen by the world perhaps as well, and that's another element to explore, but how do we come back from this? I mean, is there a way? Back from this, so people are engaged in that way. It's okay, so it's really difficult because th there's so many, we don't really know where we're going to end up. Like, it, this isn't about Brexit, I agree, but Brexit will condition how things are going to end up. Because look, if, if we go into no deal, the proper, proper no deal in March 2019, this country is about to experience one of the most catastrophic, humiliating moments of its post war history. I mean, it's, it's, it's hard to overstate just how big an event that would be. If we go into some kind of perpetual transition, then it really actually isn't going to change that much on a day-to-day -day sort of thing. It would just be a gradual <laughs> sort of decline, really. And those end up with very different social ramifications and really, really different cultural ramifications. Then it depends who takes advantage of it. You could easily see Jeremy Corbyn taking it on. Now, I agree, Labour has been, you know, perpetually mercurial about what's going on in its heartlands and willing to sort of tolerate all this nativist sort of stuff going on, not challenging it enough, trying to keep this very broad electoral coalition on board. But if Corbyn got into power, I don't believe that, that guy cares about free movement or anything like that. He's, he's a pro-immigration guy. However, I could easily see a populist right winger taking advantage of radically reduced material circumstances in this country in order to blame immigrants and create, you know, a British Trump or something that could even be more pernicious than that. So because of the, we've never been in such a scenario with so many political and economic variables. And because of that, it's really very difficult to predict the way that this will go. Just on a grassroots, non-political I, I can't see how we're going to go. I don't see this country ever going far. I just don't think, only because I come from a background where my grandparents bought Cable Street alongside, you know, all the, all the working class in this country are not actually particularly right wing. In, that's what I would call Britishness. I remember hearing my great grandparents who, and, who were immigrants coming over here and adopting, you know, loving the, their adopted home country and fighting alongside. It was about a workers' thing, it was about a solidarity of workers, and that, that was an amazing thing. I think they'd be having turning in their grave if they could see what's happened now to the Labour Party. I, I feel the same aversion, but you know what it makes me think of is, um, you know George Orwell has the line in the Unicorn essay where he basically goes, look, if socialism comes to this country, we're still going to keep the Queen and we're still going to have the red post box and the vicar on a bicycle. Now, if we go far right in this country, it'll be in a Farage kind of sense of, you know, it still has all of those accoutrements of the normal, you know, twee Britishness is presented in a way that is tolerable, but ultimately entails a really quite severe right wing. But he's run the same time as Nigel Farage to become an MP, which I reminded him on TV the other night, didn't go down very well. Uh, and he's, <laughs> yeah, he's exactly. never made it. Yeah. And, yeah. I, and I don't necessarily mean him specifically. I mean, well, that manner of communicating really yes. quite right wing ideas will be done in a way that's obviously but not I'm about the jackboots or anything like that, but has the same kind of content. I, I don't think we'd end up with the We're not, I think we'll end up with a far left. Uh, I think we it's think more it's likely, <laughs> yes, I think it's probably more likely that we end up far left than far right. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but actually, I think if, if people get more involved, if there is more of an involvement from a civic point of view, I think we'll get back to a better place than we are now when it comes to politicians because we have to get, it's not, the infrastructure is there, but the, the system's not working because of the people in it. 
And I think that's where we have to take more responsibility as people and try and get better politicians How do we in this do place by, How vote, that by voting for them. But oh, or by actually protesting. We're going to have to get back to actually being, you know, bombarding them with their surgeries and their... But that's all we do is protest. We're a country of protesters now. No, we haven't actually. We've been, we've been very lazy. People I've have been, been quite lazy. Yeah, people have not actually been well, that lazy. I, I think to that point, I mean, well, you can argue about but I was going to say, I mean, Gina is sort of chief Brexit protester. Um, I'm woman on the ground. <laughs> yes, but, but I wonder if, you know, on that day, for a lot of people who obviously voted to remain, it was like... There was a bereavement, you know, they felt so upset. They, you, you maybe thought they would take to the streets, perhaps in their millions. And you didn't see that happen. Yes. Well, there's been three marches, three marches. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah. No, 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 but right. I mean, right. I, I suppose I mean like, you know, in our, in our social media head, everyone's Katniss Everdeen, you know, it's everybody thinks they're in the Hunger Games, <laughs> sticking it to the capital. That's, I blame. That's, that's, I bloody blame the Hunger Games for all of this, because everybody thinks they're sticking it to the man. But they don't really know what the man is, and they really can't be bothered to stick it to him in person when he's getting up and going on a march. <laughs> They'd rather do it in so there. So the protest you know. is digital, not on the street. Yes, but people that's think they're protesting, protesting, and that's the difference. As when I was a student, you were out there every other week, actually, exactly. with your, you know, marching and throwing eggs at people and doing, you know, anything like that. But these days, everybody thinks they're a protester because they can have a computer. But, but how how would we get people to engage with with? the systems that govern them that feel like they've been left out of for so long, when perhaps you would also argue that people ignored immigration and what it was doing, okay, as an example. So Dame Louise Casey, a very senior civil servant, has done this huge report about integration in this country. And it, it sounds terribly boring, but I do employ you to actually have a read of it, because it's gone where lots of politicians haven't gone, I mean, she was asked to do it by the government, about... Because what I'm always struck by is, I can't really see everyone's faces, but the people who have these debates, and I host you know, them, them on the BBC, are often not the voices of the people who do feel completely, not just disenfranchised, but maybe don't speak the language that well. We try and get them on, we try and book them, we try and hear their voices. And, and we also haven't discussed it, it's possibly not relevant fully for this conversation, but obviously we have people within us who feel so separate to us, they want to go to Syria. I mean, that's obviously a very small problem in terms of the scale, but it's obviously a huge problem with what it does. And I just wonder about integration, if we're talking about national identity, have we become worse at absorbing people in a proper way because our politicians lacked the language because they didn't want to seem politically correct? I find this all about, I mean, to be honest, I mean, part of it is I also don't feel that we hear very much from immigrants themselves when we have those debates. I don't see very many people having on, like, you know, people that have arrived from Bangladesh or from Pakistan. In the same way, you know, when Macron won, I don't remember anyone going out there going, right, we're going to get really into liberal cafes now and find out how this section of the population feels about things in the way that they do, you know, in the way that they most certainly would have done if Le Pen had. So I think we can, th there can be a lack of complexity in the way that we assess that. On the integration side, I, look, I find that really difficult, and I, people don't like the answers that I have to that, because I don't even accept the idea that people should have to learn the English language. To me, if you are entitled to be here legally, you're entitled to be here, and I'm proud to live in a country where the state doesn't get to tell you what language you have to speak. The, the state doesn't have that ability to interfere in your personal life. Now, those views are now as profoundly unpopular as it's possible for liberal ideas to be, but those seem to me core, decent liberal values which typify what is best about this country. But isn't that the values, don't want to give what up. I was talking about is about the values of bringing this together. That you don't, it doesn't matter what language you speak. Or no, the language, language is general, important. Like, because if you, if you, <laughs> but the, yeah. you, from a practical point of view, it's very important. Um, but I think you, you would end up being, if you want to feel at home in a country, you wouldn't speak its language. But that's to an aside is that if you respect people, you love thy neighbour, you treat people as you would want to be treated yourself, those are all values. And that's what binds us, binds us together as a national identity. God. So I find that really existential, and I find it really interesting that you say that language is important, but put that to the side. Language is, I mean, looking at it on a... Sorry, point, principles are existential? No, I, I, I find the idea... Two things. One, I think language is unbelievably important. I think words are important. I think communication is important. One can spiritually communicate to love thy neighbour and all the things you were talking about, but on a practical... No, I'm talking about practical level. I think language is, is important. It's obviously true that it's important. I just don't think it's the state's role to enforce which languages you must speak I, in I, order to it, access your legal service. And there we have the interesting <laughs> debate. But I think it's, it's complicated, I agree with you, but one would like to... You know, if I go and live in a foreign country, 
I want to be able to communicate <coughs> with, you, with the people of that country. And I think, I don't understand where you're coming from on that. So, me too, and I agree with that, but I think that's a personal decision for you to make, not one that the state gets to enforce. But I would that's understand, but I would, why would I take offence if I choose to go in Iceland and the, and, 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 or Helsinki and they say, you know, while you're, well, as you come here, we think it's right that you learn Finnish, or if I go and live in Wales, <laughs> people say we'd really like Again, it's not about the offence, really, it's just about where I think the proper limitations of the state are in a liberal society. Although you could argue back to that point, and now I'm going to open it up if you do want to say anything, start <laughs> thinking now. Um, you could argue back to that point, which we have seen evidence of through Daily Louise Casey's review, and other bits of research on this is that women from certain backgrounds are not brought forward yeah, into really the society Absolutely. that they are in because if it's not mandated by the state, they don't get taught how to speak English. No, it's a way of controlling. And, and it's a way of controlling. Well, although there are other, I mean, we've seen in sort of countries, especially in Scandinavian countries, where the best way of targeting exactly those communities is to put stuff, say, within the GP surgery that you can, if you're quite cautious about where you look at where public services are delivered. Try to get out from underneath sort of community elders and authority that yes. is typically mayor within their society. But, that, there but, are, but I do accept there that are it, it's a strong counter. about helping people when they come here to actually feel part of our national identity, which is where we started us. Okay, well, you've got lots to, if you are going to the play this evening, I'm sure you will enjoy it. It's absolutely wonderful. I hugely enjoy it, as we've all been discussing, uh, off stage, and we will let the, uh, the actors come out and plant their garden of oh, Englishness. So good. Um, but thank you very much to my panel. Please put your hands together.